Thanks for inviting me, and I think you'll have some fun with tonight's presentation. It's a fun topic, um, and it's stratospheric ballooning on steroids. <laughs> but it was interesting when I was listening this morning uh, to the presentations and everything else, the same stuff that you guys deal with, launching your stratospheric balloons are exactly a lot of the same things that I have to deal with when doing the weather for stratospheric balloon flights, uh, trajectory, recovery, lakes, landing in the wrong places, all of those things that I have to deal with. So it all applies. And I have to tell you, I am extremely excited about what you guys are doing. I think the stratosphere is the next frontier of aviation. And I think we're on the cusp of a lot of really neat things happening in the stratosphere going forward. And a lot of what you're doing with your research is going to be pivotal in that. And I think there's going to be more and more research that needs to be done up there. And Red Bull Stratos is just one example of probing into the stratosphere and certainly promoting an energy drink, but at the same time inspiring people and getting some good science along the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the project. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you from a, balloon, a stratospheric ballooning standpoint, a lot of the things that I had to deal with and what we ran into. Of course, the finished product at the end, to a lot of people, maybe looked like it was pretty easy. But we had five flights. We used nine balloons. We had, we had aborted flights. We had things come up. It was a very difficult project. So when you're frustrated, it's too windy, or something bad happens, your payload doesn't report, or you can't find your payload, don't worry, we have, uh, we have problems too. All right, so why the stratosphere? Why send somebody up in the stratosphere? Why send a person up there? And there's a good reason for it. After World War II, when they started to invent aircraft that would go higher, starting with the U, uh, U-2 spy plane, the Air Force had to determine, can a pilot survive a stratospheric jump? Can a pilot exit a plane and have some chance of survival? So right after World War II, when the spy planes were, were developed, they did a project called Project High Dive, which using balloons, mostly to about 90,000 feet, they took these dummies and dropped them. They just dropped them to see what would happen. <laughs> What's great about this Project High Dive is for you UFO buffs and the Roswell story, a lot of these were all dropped over southern New Mexico. <laughs> and the Air Force claims that people didn't really find aliens. They found some of these dummies because they didn't pick up a lot of them. But what they found out when they dropped these dummies was that they would spin 200 times a minute. So they figured that if a pilot had to escape that high, if there was no way using a parachute or a drogue system to slow him down, the spin would kill the pilot. So they embarked on a project called Project Excelsior. Now, some of you may have heard of this gentleman, Joe Kittinger. Uh, Captain Joe Kittinger was put in charge of this project in White Sands, New Mexico, uh, in the late 50s to develop a program that would develop a pressurized suit and a parachute drogue system that would allow a pilot high altitude escape from the stratosphere, especially above the Armstrong line, around 65,000 feet or so, where you have to have pressurized equipment. And this led the culmination to his final jump. He had three jumps he did from altitudes that went up higher. He was almost killed on his second jump with the parachute wrapped around his neck. He blacked out, but an automatic parachute device, which is still used today, deployed his chute before he landed. But I want you to contrast this photo with the stuff I'm going to show you from Red Bull. Notice the duct tape on, the, on, his, on his legs and on his equipment pack there. And notice that Joe didn't jump out of a pressurized capsule. He jumped out of a gondola that was in open space. He rode from the ground on a White Sands missile range all the way to 102,800 feet and then jumped. He survived the jump, obviously, and was quickly promoted to colonel, <laughs> which, he sh which, he, which he should have been. And for those of you familiar with the movie The Right Stuff about the Mercury 7 astronauts, they left Joe out because this guy is 
someone who still has the right stuff. Um, what he did was the per precursor in developing his pressure suit that would go into the space program. So a lot of the beginnings of the space program actually began with Project Excelsior. Now fast forward oh, a little bit in time here, and we're going to go about looking at other temps. But speaking of tough, if you notice, it may be a little difficult to see, but on his right hand, it looks swollen. And it's swollen because his pressure suit sprung a leak around his wrist at about 80,000 feet. But he knew if he radioed the ground, they would terminate the flight. So he says, I'm going to suck it up. Even though his suit was depressurizing, he went all the way up and he still jumped and his hand swelled to twice the normal size. Um, but it actually came down. He didn't have any impacts afterwards. Joe then went on to be a fighter pilot in Vietnam, was shot down and spent several months in the Hanoi Hill uh, afterwards. Now, after the Cold War was over, as soon as the Russians figured out we did this, they had to do it. They had something called the Volga program, which was send some cosmonauts up in a, in a balloon and have them jump. They got a, a, a jump from 83,000 feet. However, uh, we also know that some cosmonauts died. We know of at least one. But that's as high as they got. Go to 1963, a truck driver named Nick Patnita, skydiver, self-funded his own attempt to break Colonel Kittinger's record. He actually did this out of Sioux Falls. And unfortunately, on his third attempt, for reasons unknown, he opened his pressurized helmet at about 50,000 feet. Uh, the ground crew knew that there was an emergency and they released the capsule under parachute and brought him down. The parachute was unreefed, and this is important for later with the Red Bull project. And by the time it took so long to get him down to the ground that when he was found, he was in a coma and he died two weeks later. Now since then, um, there have been many people who have claimed that they were going to try to beat Colonel Joe Kittinger's record. They got on TV. They were very successful at getting themselves promoted on, in the newspapers and television, but never were able to put together a program to, to fly. Uh, Colonel Kittinger told, tells me that he would get a call at least once a week from someone saying that he was going to break his record and ask him if he would be part of the team. And he, he refused every time until Red Bull came along. So Red Bull Stratos, this was an enormous project. We had 300 individuals on site. On the final day, we had the balloon launch team. We had all the technical support, communications. We had TV production, internet production. We had an amazing amount of people. We had 300 people on site, and less than 30 people were involved in the balloon launch. <laughs> so you can see we had a lot of uh, people doing everything else. OK, the goals of Red Bull Stratos. New designs and pressure suit technology, break Colonel Joe Kittinger's record. This was a big one and a controversial one. Break the sound barrier without the aid of an aircraft. Could a person fall so quickly and break the sound barrier? That prove the feasibility of a, the survivability of a high altitude escape. We all know about the space shuttle accidents. Um, we knew that there's no way right now in a lot of private space ventures, whether or not you can survive a, a dive from the atmosphere, from the stratosphere. So those were the goals. Uh, the core team was put together by a small company in Lancaster, California called Sage Child Aerospace. Art Thompson is the president of the company right there. He put together the team, Felix Baumgartner, the Austrian skydiver. He's, he was known for being a base jumper. He would jump off the tallest buildings in the world, usually without permission. Um, and do other things. But it was Felix and Art Thompson who approached Red Bull about nine years ago with this idea. And it took some convincing, but after a while, they put it together. Left of him is the Colonel Joe Kittinger. He signed up to be an advisor on this. And what, this was huge because the only reason he did was Red Bull said they would allow this program to be conducted as a test flight program, just not send somebody up on one balloon flight, but do multiple flights, gather data, test systems before it was done. He had to get their commitment before they did that, and he put it on. Here's Dr. John Clark. Some of you um, heard Dr. Clark uh, here speak. He was the head of the medical team, and we had some uh, 
former uh, Lockheed Martin test pilots, uh, Mike, Mike Todd there on the right. This was the launch team. So when you guys put together a launch team, this was the launch team out of Albuquerque, New Mexico uh, with a company called ATA Aerospace. Almost every person you see in there, with the exception of a few, is retired Air Force who worked with the Air Force balloon program. Uh, it was that crew right there that we were able to uh, put together and launch the balloon with. Uh, that's me on the left. I had worked with the same group of people on dozens of flights before. So we were a balloon launch team with a lot of experience that was hired to do the balloon ops. Ed Coca was the launch director. This is somebody, when we do these big balloons, we have a launch team. He's in charge of making the final decision to launch, while somebody like me would be in mission control, uh, checking on the weather elements and making sure everything's ready to go. So, Red Bull Stratos meteorologist, that was my job. Um, as you heard in my bio, I'm a hot air balloon pilot, and to make a very long story short, I got involved in stratospheric ballooning pretty much by happen chance. Since I was involved in hot air ballooning and was a meteorologist, um, you get really popular among other balloonists when they find out you're a weather guy. And I ended up doing weather forecasting for the Air Force Research Labs out of, out of Albuquerque, out of Kirtland, um, and doing support for stratospheric missions. And I had been doing that for about seven or eight years. And when Red Bull hired ATA Aerospace, I was hired on as being the, the meteorologist. But it was a lot more than that, and it's the same thing that you guys deal with. Because it was my responsibility to predict the weather for launching. These huge balloons are so sensitive to the weather, we have to have perfect conditions. But it was also my duty for trajectory. It was also my duty to work with the FAA for airspace. It was my duty to issue the NOTAMs. It was, my issue, it was my responsibility to deconflict with military operating areas since we were in New Mexico, we were surrounded by them. It was also my responsibility to make sure the payload or the capsule was recovered in good order uh, because if it wasn't, you only had one capsule and that was a problem. I didn't want to have Red Bull deal with a capsule in a Walmart parking lot or like a lake or in somebody's backyard. So the responsibilities, not the hardest responsibility was the go-no-go. No go. It was my decision on whether or not we launched on any particular day. And that was the hardest. The hardest decision was not to say we're going. The hardest decision was to say we're not. Um, those, were the, those, were the, those were the harder, harder decisions to go. So what did I use for weather tools? The same thing that you guys use. Use all the basic model suites. Um, we used the radio sounds out of Albuquerque and El Paso. For the last balloon flight, we had our own Vaisala system that we could do our own radio sound launches, but we had to have special balloons to get us to 130,000 feet um, so we could get a good radio sound profile of what the atmosphere was going to be like. Um, and then right here, this was probably this little system right here was probably as pivotal as, as anything to the success of Red Bull Stratos. We just got a, one of these advertising blimps online, and at the bottom of it, we tethered a Davis Vantage View wireless weather station. We built this little platform, and we put it on a tether system, and we would tether this a few hundred feet off the ground. On the final day, we actually tethered it to 800 feet off the ground, and I used this as a wind profile for what the wind speed would be at the top of a balloon. When the balloons are stood up, I had to know what the wind speed was going to be at the top. And I was able, in mission control, from probably about 500 yards away, get a signal from that. And I had a little readout that would tell me what the wind speed was at the top. Of course, we never figured out how to get the direction to work. But I would put together a climatology, figure out when are they going to be the best times of year to do this. Here's something you'll recognize for October. We did the final flight. Here's a climatology of what the upper level winds would be like in the stratosphere, which way the balloon would go so we could do the trajectory. The trajectory was critical, because not only did Red Bull want to just try to beat Joe Kittinger's record, they wanted to broadcast this live with a 20 second delay around the world on the internet and television. So tr strategically, we had to place all of the communications equipment to be able to stream this event live, audio and video, 
across southeastern New Mexico, and that I had to tell them where I thought the capsule and the balloon would go so they could be in a strategic location that we would be in the right position to get it. So they just, we just couldn't willy-nilly say, oh, you're going east. I'd have to give them as, as much of a good trajectory forecast as I possibly could. And there's an example, something you guys have seen of all the time. That would be something I'd give them in a daily briefing. Something that well, I also had to deal with, and I'm going to show you some, some uh, things about it here, which was what we used is was called a reefed parachute. Reef parachute would allow us to get the capsule and Felix down quickly if there was a, if there was a an emergency, or let's say Felix changed his mind. I'm not jumping. Bring me down. Well, a reef parachute basically means we constrict the width of the parachute so the capsule would come down quicker and then deploy the parachute fully at a lower altitude. So you constrict the parachute and you drop it down. My job here was to come up with what was called a circular error probable where I would have to forecast where the payload would land based on the winds and under a parachute, just like you guys do, but then with a constricted parachute and then a full parachute. So it was very difficult to calculate descent trajectories with the capsule because I had to deal with a changing configuration of the parachute at different altitudes, different descent rates, things would change. Purple area would be a populated area we had had to avoid, and uh, these are all things that we had to work with. Media cameras and communications, this is all part of um, the thing, as you can see, it became a huge production. Uh, this is me in a press conference with Colonel Joe and Art Thompson. I also have some experience in, in broadcasting, and so they would put me out in front of the media all the time. But I will tell you, they only wanted to talk to me when the weather was bad. <laughs> if the weather was good and everything went great, they didn't need to talk to Don, no. But if the balloon blew over or we had a wind gust, bring Don out here um, to do that. And that also means when you're the weather guy is you got to say, you got to give bad news. This was taken on our second man jump in July when everything went wrong. And this is me telling Felix and uh, the team right there that we were going to have to scrub, uh, that we weren't going to be able to go uh, based on uh, the weather conditions that we were going to go through. So you were constantly in demand as being the weather person. Are we going? Are we not going? When are we going? All those things. Roswell, New Mexico was picked. Roswell, New Mexico is great. It, New Mexico, and it, when you're around 35 degrees latitude, is a wonderful place to be for big balloons. You have great mornings, you have a lot of real estate, and the key is mornings, because we, have, we can have really good wind conditions in the morning. And with all the real estate, it's great. However, we also have a lot of military areas which made flight trajectories and FAA coordination a little bit tricky. Of course, stratospheric balloon, we're using stratofilm with these things. Um, the thickness of these balloons is not much more than a sandwich bag. In fact, I brought a piece of the balloon from the final jump with me. You guys can pass around and look at it. Extremely fragile on the ground. Extremely fragile. They can, it can actually tear easily. Very sensitive to the wind since these balloons are so big. But once they get helium in them, once they get stood up, they are rocks. These are amazing pieces of technology that can carry very heavy payloads and are a great instrument. But getting them off the ground is very difficult. Conditions have to be just right. We did what was called a dynamic launch. Dynamic launch meaning that with the use of that crane, we would inflate the balloon with what we would call a bubble. And then it would be uh, in a spool where it's constricted the balloon's released, and then the crane drives, and as soon as the balloon reaches its, its perfect vertical um, position, and the balloon is pulling on the payload, then we release, and the crane and the balloon have to be aligned perfectly with the wind direction. You can't be 30 degrees off, you can't be 90 degrees off. The crane will move with the wind. The beauty of a dynamic launch is this allows you to launch these big balloons with a little bit of wind. It can't be more than four or five. And on our last flight, it couldn't be more than two. But a dynamic launch allows you, it's like you guys when you run with the balloon, okay? That's a dynamic launch, but we do it with a big crane. And I'll show you some video here as we go along here. It takes a lot of people. 
These balloons are huge. I'll talk a little bit about the, the last balloon that we used and how big it was. Uh, but it definitely takes teamwork, a lot of people together. So I told you it was a test flight program. We were going to do two unmanned flights, then three manned flights before we were going to uh, go to the world with this and, and try and break Joe Kittinger's record. So this spanned over quite a while. The first test flight we did in December 2011 to 90,000 feet, we were going to drop pods that uh, were the same weight as Felix. We were going to test parachutes. We were going to test GPS systems, communication systems. We were going to test the crush pads on the capsule. This uh, was everything that you would normally do. Of course, we were in New Mexico. <laughs> Somebody posted the stuff that was on the internet after this was amazing. But this is one of my favorite ones. So yeah, you're in New Mexico, have Wiley Coyote be our first one to jump out. And what I'm going to show you now here is a video of our first test flight. And this will give you a little bit of an example of what the dynamic launch is like. And I'll let you know it was 49% overcast when we launched this. <laughs> that pod dropping right there is what we call Felix Bomb Gardner. It does look like a little bit, and that's not a cloud, by the way. That's just fog. There was no clouds in this day. No, we actually had to court. We actually had to get permission from the airport to be able to take off that day, but we had good wind. So we're going to take this to 90,000 feet, and it's a test flight program. We're testing all of our systems. So this video doesn't wow you guys like it wows other people because you see all this stuff all the time. But what we're doing here is we're testing everything. We're testing telescopes. We're testing everything to see, uh, to work our way to the next test flight, which was going to be 110,000 feet. And, uh, and you'll see a good reason why we would clear airspace uh, before we do this, because we dropped this big 240-pound dummy. And so inside of that is all this equipment that we're going to test things with. And you can see it a little tumbling a little bit and everything down. Now, this was my big test right here was, it was my job to predict where the capsule would land under parachute. So here we are dropping it. I want to let you guys know uh, who, who does chase here that I landed it right next to a road. <laughs> this is actually right on the Texas-New Mexico border. Um, and you'll notice when we come down and land here, I want you to notice how hard it hits. This is why you do tests, because we landed with way too many Gs. Boom. Ouch. And there's another perspective right here as it comes on down. But it worked great. The reef's parachute worked. Um, a lot of the GPS and the communications worked. The video worked. Uh, for the most part, the capsule worked. Now, I talked to you a little bit about um, what a reef parachute system is like. And let me see. I may need to. Oh, here we go. This is what it looks like when we terminate. You'll notice the balloon split open. And then notice the reefed parachute design. So when you guys start doing really big balloons, big heavy payloads, the reef system is great when it works because you get your payload down really quickly and you can increase your accuracy of landing. Now you see it deploy. So that deploys at about 20,000 feet. I cut out a lot of space there. But notice how stable that is. And then you'll notice here on landing, So the reef design gets you down much, much quicker. And once you figure out uh, how to do the math on, on your descent analysis, uh, it can be quite good. Uh, tip over. There we go. So the reef parachute was, was something kind of new that we were doing. So it was a very successful test flight. Now what I didn't show you was the day before, we. Uh, had a bit of an issue and we tore a balloon. So we used, we used two balloons for the first flight. Now, I want to show you guys something else. This may be a little bit hard for you to see. This was our next test flight. This was in January. So we came back a month later. It was 23 degrees this morning. We had a perfect morning, dead calm. We were using a 10 million cubic foot balloon. And what ends up happening is, is that the balloon goes up perfectly. But what ends up happening is, as soon as we drive the crane, it's going to be a little hard for you to see the way this video is. The crane's right here. 
But what ends up happening is the crane drives forward. Again, we have no wind. It's perfect. You can see the pie ball here that we have tethered is barely moving. The balloon is released and the balloon doesn't go anywhere. It stays two feet off the ground. So we have a 10 million cubic foot balloon payload. We've got about $60,000 worth of helium in there. See the capsule going back and forth? Now I told you it was a cold morning. Does anybody have any idea why the balloon didn't take off very quickly? Was the helium cold? Well, this is what ends up happening. So do you, any of you guys fly with ballast at all? Or thought about ballast? Well, on these flights, we always make sure we have at least 10% ballast weight, that we can release ballast if we need to do some maneuvers up high. We had 350 pounds of ballast. And it's an inert little composite, look like little BBs that we release. We ended up, at this moment in time, I'm screaming at our person who's in charge of the balloon uh, operations commands, which was poor. Dump all your ballast now. We dropped 350 pounds of ballast on this field. And as you'll see here in a minute, after we released 350 pounds, the balloon went up. And we actually had a very successful flight. But what ended up happening, I totally never saw it coming. I will now. But while the balloon was being inflated, dropped to 23 degrees, and we had a thin layer of frost on everything. And I should have known this. I, we got a radio command from one of the video people saying, I can't put the tape on the capsule because there's frost on it. So after the flight was done, we sat down and we did a very simple calculation of the surface area of the balloon and how much frost could have weighed. Our calculation was 355 pounds of frost. And we had 350 pounds of ballast. So we were minus five, but it was enough for this balloon to get off the ground. And we averted disaster because not far from the air is a subdivision. And if we would have had to terminate that balloon, that was about $60,000 of helium. Uh, that was probably about a $50,000 balloon. We didn't want to do that. But we actually went up to 110,000 feet. So it was very challenging. OK, so now we go to our first manned flight, which was now in March. The goal was to get to 71,000 feet, get above the Armstrong line where you need a pressurized um, suit. And this is going to be Felix's first jump. And we had a failure on the first attempt. And I want to show you something, what will happen. This is what you call a mechanical failure on a big balloon. Right here, see it split open? We had a bad balloon. It just completely failed. The good news was, well, the bad news was Felix was in the capsule. The good news is it failed before we released him. Notice that we have a parachute under there. But we had to have Felix 3,000 feet above the ground before the parachute was even effective. So if we would have released him while this balloon had failed, it would have been a very bad situation. So boom, there goes another balloon. Two flights, we've used four balloons. This flight, however, the first manned flight was a huge success. We went out the next day. We had another balloon. We, got a, we had a different manufacturer, a bit of a bigger balloon. He jumped from 71,000 feet, huge success. We got good data. So now this went to man flight two, July 2012. As hard as the last mission was, this one was the most challenging. Uh, this time of year, as you guys know, the stratospheric winds are going to go very strong from the east to the west. And about 60 miles west of Roswell is a little installation called White Sands Missile Range, where airspace is very guarded. In fact, God has to have permission to be over White Sands airspace. It's very difficult. And any time you go uh, close to there or any operation there, it's very difficult to work around. But we knew we were going to fly west, and we had a bunch of problems. I'll show you a little about in a minute. Um, we had GPS jamming that day. Um, very rugged terrain. 
and some other things that happened that made my life very, very difficult. What I'm going to show you here is a video of uh, what happened on release. We actually went to 97,000 feet. Felix jumped, successfully landed. But that video I showed you about a reefed parachute, well, something happened. The reefing did not deploy at 20,000 feet. Let's bring this. And what ended up happening is we hit the ground at 45 miles an hour and did severe damage to the capsule. The, the parachute basically was only 16 feet wide when it should have been 100 feet when it hit the ground. Also on this flight, at about 75,000 feet, we lost all GPS. We lost all tracking. It's like you're tracking your balloon, whether it's on APRS, a fire, whatever, and just imagine it going away. Now, we had called White Sands Missile Range. We checked with all the NOTAMs, and they claimed there was no jam. But we know that there were some guys in the trailer out in the desert doing this. Wait till they see this. Because we actually lost GPS at 72,000 feet, and miraculously it came back when we came down again at 72,000 feet. But I had to navigate for about 45 minutes not knowing where the balloon was, especially after Felix jumped. So my job to get the, the payload back down was very difficult. Not only was it difficult with the chute not opening completely, but I could not land it in White Sands missile range. The Air Force and the Army are not really thrilled when we have a capsule with 50 cameras on it, overflying and insulation, let alone with a foreign national, Felix Baumgartner, an Austrian on board. We ended up, I ended up using my iPhone stopwatch and had people take, uh, I had to make an estimate on heading and speed, and then I used my, my stopwatch on my iPhone to calculate when we should cut down. And we landed within one mile of White Sands Missile Range. So actually, I had to do math. You know, we were writing on the backs of piece of paper trying to figure out how to do this. So this was a, a challenging flight. We had weather delays. We had GPS jamming. We almost went into restricted airspace. Thankfully, the jump went good, but the capsule was hitting the ground at 50 miles an hour. The best analogy is, it's like when you get in a really bad car wreck, and the insurance company says, we're not going to total it. You've got to fix it. So it was almost total, but amazingly enough, they turned around and got it fixed. This is one of my favorite pictures of the whole project. Here's a guy in Roswell, New Mexico, standing in a space suit in the middle of the desert. Uh, Felix jumped from 97,000 feet. He went over 536 miles an hour. He did spin. Now this was something that we were concerned about. His lower jump, he really didn't spin. But from 97,000 feet, he did feel the spin and rotation. But he was able to uh, get out of it and land uh, safely. So we were going to do the last flight in August, which was the exact same time of year that Joe Kittinger did his jump. And August tends to be a good time of year down there to do this. But we got delayed because they had to fix the capsule, which would now take us to Man Balloon Flight 3. So Man Balloon Flight 3 would require a 29.8 million cubic foot balloon. Uh, this balloon laid out with its parachute, all of its lines that we needed would be longer than a Saturn V rocket. We were 727 feet long on the runway. Okay, and uh, we used just a little bit of helium uh, for this. Um, and the balloon, when we stood it up, was going to be uh, almost 800 feet altogether. From a weather standpoint, this was very difficult for me because we could not have the wind more than two miles an hour on the ground. The wind could not be more than two miles an hour at the top of the balloon. The balloon had to be laid out perfectly with the wind direction. And this is going to be the biggest balloon to ever carry a person. And, oh, by the way, it's going to be on live television. So other than that, I had no pressure uh, at all. And so we had two of these balloons. We had two of them. So we had two chances, really. And so on our first attempt, 
um, which was uh, Tuesday, October 9th, I have identified a good weather window. Actually, it looked perfect. If I were to draw up a weather chart that says this is the day that will break Colonel Joe Kinder's record, we're going to go to at least 120,000 feet, that Tuesday was it. Um, just a quick thing is we use the Roswell Airport and we use this section of runway, 170 right here was the main runway we used. We also used this runway. Unlike Columbia balloons and other people, we don't have a square pad where you can just run in any direction. We had to have the winds match the runway. Luckily in Roswell, this time of year, the winds match up with the climatology, line up with the runway very well, but we had some restrictions on what we could do. Things really had to line up and go our way. And to give you some perspective of how big the balloon was, this was our first manned balloon, 357 feet. Manned flight two was 476 feet, and then 709 feet. The inversion layer uh, in Roswell um, on these October mornings we were trying this was actually above, the, the balloon was going above the inversion layer. That's how tall it was. These other balloons, we could have a, and what happens at the inversion layer is we get a steady stream of, jet, of wind that basically will stay during the cold of the morning. So on both mornings of our third attempt, I would see zero on the surface wind. On that aerostat that was tethered at 800 feet, one morning it was, it was 22, 24 miles an hour. So if we let the balloon go, it would go up through this column of calm, but the balloon, as soon as we get to the top, would be hitting a 20 mile per hour wind and just take the top right off, which was a no-go. So we had to make sure everything was really good. And what ends up happening through the course of the morning when that inversion breaks, you have a very narrow window of opportunity. When the inversion goes away, that whole column of air from the ground to the inversion top will calm down on a good morning and you go. You have about 10 or 15 minutes, and then after that, the winds will pick up and you can have some problems. So what ended up happening on Tuesday the 9th is we had a perfect morning. You see those crystal clear blue skies. We ended up having a technical issue with a radio, and we were delayed launching by an hour and a half. By the time we were ready to go, we had well past broken the inversion, and the best analogy is we had a dust devil. <coughs> and we had a wind gust come through of 20 miles an hour that ended up destroying the balloon. Okay, so we were live on this Discovery Channel. We had eight million people live on the internet, YouTube watching us. And the balloon, we had, we, I had to cancel the flight. It, the winds got too gusty, the balloon twisted. I thought the balloon might be compromised. So there went a $250,000 balloon, and there went about $80,000 worth of helium. Poof, gone. So we uh, had a lot of sad faces that day, as you can tell. But um, we learned a lot. Uh, the technical team learned that if one radio doesn't work and we have a backup, let it go, keep going, don't blow your weather window. So this went to our second attempt. We had one balloon left. We had a very skeptical media who thought that we actually made the first one fail on purpose because it was a weekday and we could get more viewers on a weekend. Um, uh, but we learned a lot, but we were down to one balloon. And quite honestly, once you get past the middle of October, you're getting pretty much to the end of the stratospheric balloon season in New Mexico, and we had to make it work. So we had a team meeting. And we were going over all the problems we had on Tuesday. And um, Dr. John Clark, who some of you meet, says, hey, does anybody know what Sunday is? Sunday, Sunday is the anniversary that Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier to the day. He goes, we got to make this work. So he says, no pressure, Don. Sunday's got to work. We're going to break the sound barrier with Felix on the same, on the same day. So. What we did is we uh, then got to, and let me, I'm gonna put up some video here. What I'm showing you here is the video of the launch from the perspective of the crane driver.
At this point in time, the balloon has already been released. This balloon is so huge, it takes forever for it to go up. And if you notice, right up here, you'll see the balloon appearing shortly. And right now, the crane is driving. Even though the wind was two miles an hour, the crane had to drive at 20 miles an hour to keep up with the balloon. Unfortunately, this, the audio and the video aren't matching up because by then, uh, it's too bad, the, uh, the capsule uh, had released and gone away. But it's quite exciting to be on the, uh, on the crane when you're driving these things. So let me show you a video. I don't know if anybody can hear this or not. I will assess the situation again. We will not start inflating as soon as the balloon is completely inflated now. Got so they'll, they'll be in Unfortunately, my laptop here is having a hard time catching up. We'll let this run here, and I'll tell you a little bit. This is going to show the balloon launch in a better perspective. So how many of you watched it when it happened? Oh, wow, OK. Red Bull would be happy to do that, to hear that. But as this goes here, and hopefully the video will catch up a little bit. The um, most interesting thing was is that uh, when we did this, um, we had a lot of people who were obviously pretty skeptical uh, that we were going to make it able to work, uh, let alone launch a balloon this big. Uh, but you can see we had a great mission control. Um, I will never have that many gadgets again. Um, I had every monitor, screen, everything else that we could have uh, worked with uh, to put things together. And what I'm going to do here, this video is having such a hard time catching up. I'm just going to stop PowerPoint. Hold on here a second. I want to see if we can get a better experience for you here. Okay, this will be a, this is video of the jump itself. This will give you the GoPro images from inside the capsule and the GoPro images that were on Felix that um, were not broadcast live. Although we did have spectacular images coming down from the capsule that we had. But this is, is uh, his perspective from inside as we went up. We ended up getting to 128,300 feet uh, when the balloon finally reached float altitude. And we ended up going about 42 miles east of Roswell. But one thing that happened on the way up, and one thing that I almost canceled the flight for, is we had a jet stream wind of 138 miles an hour. So at one moment in time, he was moving 138 miles an hour, screaming across eastern New Mexico. But on that particular day, the stratosphere turned around nicely at about 110,000 feet, and we started heading west. So we screamed out, did a U-turn, and actually we were drifting back towards Roswell when uh, Felix made his jump. And it was about 42 miles away when it happened, which is good because we stayed in bounds. We stayed within all the cameras and all the equipment and everything else. So pretty incredible imagery. Um, if you ever wished that you were up with your payload, this is what it would look like. We, Felix had 10 minutes of oxygen. 
Uh, once he left the capsule and unplugged himself, he had 10 minutes, so he couldn't dilly dally. Uh, he had to be able to make up his mind and go. And at this particular moment in time, he was going through a 38 point checklist that he went over with, with Joe Kittinger. And at this moment in time, he was ready to go. I get vertigo every time I see that. And you can see how stable that balloon is. It doesn't look like it's moving. It was rock solid. We were in a very stable float con configuration. Although the balloon was porpoising about 200 feet a minute plus or minus at this time. Notice how he quickly becomes a dot. 32 seconds. 32 seconds he went Mach 1 in 32 seconds. I love this. This is slowed down a little bit, but you can see I love that perspective of the balloon behind him as he comes down. Now the biggest risk, as I told you earlier, was the spin. And this is what we knew was going to be the, a potential real problem. Um, and as he went, broke the sound barrier, um, about a minute into the jump, he started to spin and spin uh, fairly violently, I'm afraid. And we were all very much concerned that he would black out. Um, at 70 RPMs, that wasn't enough to make him black out, but certainly make him very uncomfortable. He had a, a button to push that if he felt that he was going to black out or he felt that he was going to not make it, he could have deployed a drogue chute, which would have slowed him down and stabilized his descent. And if he would have done that, he would have not broken the world record. Um, he would have had a tremendous jump, but he would have not been able to break a lot of the records he was attempting to break. It took him nine minutes and nine seconds to go from the capsule to the ground. So here we go. Now this is the good spin. Notice, notice how he's going, he's spinning one direction. Notice here in a minute he starts to, he, he will reverse his axis. There's the balloon. So here we go, he's reverse axis now and he actually ends up on his back. And at this moment in time, we are very concerned in mission control because we can see him on the video spinning wildly. Here we go. And he's looking straight up. And he's moving his hands here to try to correct his, his spin problem. Um, and it didn't work. Does anybody here skydive? Okay, he arched his back. In a pressure suit, that's not easy, but when he arched his back, it flipped him over, and he got into a, what we call the delta configuration where he was pointed down at an angle of attack that would allow him to aerodynamically be able to go down in a smooth ride. But it takes an athlete to do this. You have to stay in one position, very rigid for a long time, so he doesn't get out of control. And you can see how stable he is working his way down. He went 1.25 Mach, 838 miles an hour. Um, we had a lot of people who were convinced he was going to lose his arm and legs and spin out of control. We had a lot of people said he would never break the sound barrier. Even up to minutes before we launched, we had people trying to stop the jump. But we were confident because we did it as a test flight program. We had two other jumps, we got to gather data. We were confident, in fact, Art Thompson, the project director, calculated that Felix would spin 65 times and he did 70, so that was pretty good um, altogether. And uh, Felix, of all of his three-man jumps, his last jump, he had the best landing. No big deal, just went to 130,000 feet and came down. Uh, worked out great. You can see a helicopter there. We had chase crews, everything else, and everything else worked out pretty good. Um, of course, I couldn't celebrate. I had to get the capsule back down. Um, so while Felix was jumping, I was trying to figure out where we were going to put the capsule. We had to make sure the capsule wasn't going to come down on the chase crew or the helicopters. Uh, we had to do all of these things to make sure that uh, there was going to be, um, that we were going to be safe 
with our uh, recovery, and uh, that was an option as well. Luckily, we found a really good place to go. We cut down, and the capsule took 25 minutes to get to the ground. Uh, it landed right side up, and while it was coming down, just to give me more pressure, because they really enjoyed torturing the weatherman, as Joe Kittinger said, by the way, I'm um, good friends with the head of the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian, and he says that if the capsule's in good shape, it'll go in the Smithsonian, so don't scratch it. <laughs> so, for those of you who might complain your balloon is a pain to pick up or anything else, <laughs> that, that was 40 acres of balloon fabric. 40 acres. They had to get a special flatbed truck out of El Paso to uh, be able to put that all together. Um, and actually, here in my pocket, I'm gonna just pass this around. This is part of the balloon right here that flew on that day, but you can feel what the balloon fabric is like and how thin it is and pliable and um, how easy it would be to, uh, to go up. So yeah, so there's your chase team going back to town. And I was telling some folks um, at lunch, the funny thing is, is I, I forget the name of the uh, group, but there was a, a stratospheric balloon group out of Southern California that came out got a hotel room in Roswell, and they were like spying on us. And um, when they saw us getting ready to launch, it, uh, we, would, we would get ready to launch at 10 p.m. So do you guys get up really early in the morning to do this? OK, so try doing it at 10 p.m. to get ready, and then staying up all night. But they launched a stratospheric balloon while we did. They watched the balloon launch on TV, and then they let one go. And it did an amazing job of following us. And when our chase team went to go get the capsule, they found their payload like a few hundred yards away. I mean, it was just amazing. And they had a lot of fun with it. They, they saw where it was from, and they saw a GoPro camera. So all the chase team has their faces, and they're taking pictures. And so they messed with them a little bit, and they called them up act, acting all mad. Saying, this is Red Bull. We got your payload. <laughs> they're like, oh, we're, we, we're, 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 they said, that's OK. <laughs> so they came out and got it, and we actually talked to them. They had a great time. I, we thought it was actually really neat. They were hoping to get pictures of it on the way as it went. Um, but it was quite the experience. And you know, the, the thing to take out of this from a, from a meteorological standpoint and, and trying to figure out trajectories and trying to figure out you know, how the balloon's going to behave, where the payload's going to go, I will tell you this, I, I've been a weather forecaster for 20 plus years. Strict adherence to the model data is discouraged. You've got to build up years and as many years and months of just good old experience with using the weather models, but also using common sense. If I would have relied on weather models to tell Red Bull if we were going to launch or not, we would have never left the ground. There would never been a jump. Felix would never have a world record if we just went strictly on model data. Um, the only way you can do that is through experience. But use the models as a tool and a guide, but do not use the models as gospel. And that goes all along with trajectories as well. Um, combination preparation, practice, and timely decision making resulted in, in, the, in, in our success. And from a balloon operation standpoint, balloon ops, you know, the, as some of you guys were talking today, the preparation and the planning is, is, is really key to success. And timely decision making too is, is even with what you guys to do is what I call windows, identify your best window of opportunity, whether it's your trajectory, whether it's your best wind conditions when you launch, whether it's the conditions you're looking at, recovery, try to plan it out, do a flight plan. It sounds like that's what you guys are doing, but it really pays off. And the, re the reef parachute approach was, was critical in terms of getting that payload back down. Um, They've uh, made a documentary, it's online, it's starting to show up on cable channels now. Uh, if you want to see a lot of the whole story, it's about a two hour documentary uh, on the project. It's, it's excellent. Um, and if you're craving big balloons, you'll, you'll see a lot of them on there. So 
With that said, if you guys have questions, any questions, fair, fire away. Yes, sir. You went through a lot of technical aspects of the, of the equipment stuff. Uh, physically, what was going on with Felix when he was on that? Were you guys monitoring? Yes. Yeah, he was wired up like a laboratory rat. We, we had uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, and we could all see that in mission control. And we had a five or six person medical team. We had Dr. Clark in mission control watching all the vitals, and we had medical teams out in the field pre-positioned. Um, the amazing thing is, you know what his highest heart rate was? When he got out of his seat and stood on the step. Now you would think that that would be anxiety, but it was, it was a lot of work for him to bend over and get out of that hole and stand up. And then when he jumped, Dr. Clark said his heart rate was no different than an NBA basketball player going up and down the court. So it was, exer you know, it, was, it, was, uh, it was without a doubt very physical, but it wasn't over the top. Now when he spun, you know, that was scary. And Felix will tell you that he never he doesn't want to do that again. Um, but we did have all the medical stuff, and we had the ability to, to see it the whole time. We had a live data stream coming on in. From a technical standpoint, one of the biggest feats of this project was that everything worked. The video, the audio. Thankfully, White Sands takes Sundays off, and we didn't have anything going on. Um, but it was amazing that it all worked, and then it was broadcast live and we did get lucky. It happened prime time in Europe, um, around seven o'clock at night in Europe, Sunday evening. You know, and they said that uh, you know the Nielsen ratings that they have in Europe, it was like seven out of ten television sets were watching it uh, as it happened. But to have that all pulled off from start to finish was amazing from a technical standpoint. But Red Bull had the best people that they hired for all the video and audio and everything else. Yes, sir. What's the benefit of a brief parachute versus a two-stage deployment? Um, first of all, you've only got one chute to worry about. Um, I've been on projects with three chutes, and I'll never do it again. <laughs> um, just because of the complexity, it just there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, it's it's very simple, and it it allows you 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 can be more accurate with with a one with a reef chute. Um, it's got a de-reef, um, and we had five flights, and we had four successful de-reefs. And the, 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 the problem we had with our de-reef was a human error, a human wiring error at the end of it. It was not a mechanical failure. Yes, sir? Was there some mechanism to pull his chute if he couldn't have done it? Yes. He had a device, I'm trying to remember the name, that would have deployed at a certain altitude. So if he would have passed out, it would have opened up. He opened his chute at about 10,000 feet. And uh, I think it was about 7,500 feet it would have opened if he hadn't. Um, so that, that safety was built in as well. And we were able to communicate with him a little bit on the way down. And the amazing thing, in his chest pack was a Motorola one watt radio. That's how we talked to him, believe it or not. One watt, that's all it took. So you can do amazing things with, as you guys know, with just a little bit of electronics. Of course, no one's going to ask me how much this cost. I always get that question. There you go. There you go. Thank you very much. Well, they've never told me. Of course, they had to pay me. They had to pay me my 20 million. You know, of course, my fee. But um, it actually cost them about 40 million. Now that sounds over the top, right? Now, from a balloon op standpoint, the balloon operations, the balloons, the helium. The chase crew, the hotel, the rental car, the per diem was about 10 million. So the rest of their expense was actually the video production, um, doing all of these other things that the, the marketing and media people were doing. It cost about $40 million a year to sponsor a NASCAR. So for the cost of a NASCAR, they were able to do Red Bull Stratos. And the amazing thing is, is their global worldwide sales of Red Bull increased 2% after the jump. And 2% doesn't sound a lot, but it's a lot of money. And um, they, uh, YouTube said the biggest live event that YouTube had ever, 
done was during the uh, Summer Olympics and that they said that they had 500,000 concurrent YouTube viewers and they said you should expect about 500,000. And on the last jump we had 9 million YouTube viewers and they estimated 50 uh, to 100 million viewers on uh, television just in the United States. And they, Red Bull's best estimate is that the people who saw it live on the internet and on TV and the people who saw it later, the video, it's close to a billion impressions. So if you would ask any large corporation if you could get a billion impressions for $40 million, everybody would do it. So uh, they took a big risk, but it, it paid off big time. Yes, sir. You said starting off that we're on the cusp of a new era of discovery and in the stratosphere. What do you have in mind? What are you thinking? Well, I can tell you from, from other things that I do and other projects that I'm working on. Um, in the past, I've worked on stratospheric platforms, whether it's an airship or something that can station keep in the stratosphere. The, our government and our military would absolutely love to have a stratospheric platform that can station keep for days and weeks. I've worked on a couple of projects where we're this close. Um, imagine a cell tower at 65,000 feet. Talk about, you know, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you everywhere. Um, you know, I'm, right now I'm working on a, this, it was in the news this past week, there's a project called the Worldview Experience where they want to take paid passengers. Um, they want to take people up to the stratosphere and give them the experience and bring them back down. Uh, I'm working on several other projects to where uh, a, good ex uh, a communications node where instead of, let's say you have, uh, we are working on a project in Alaska and they wanted to recreate the great Alaskan earthquake where Alaska's cut off from the mainland. Well, a concept they're working on is you have a, a, a payload and a balloon in a crate and some helium handy, and if all communications go down, you go out and you launch the stratospheric node, and all of a sudden you've got internet, phone, and RF, and you're not launching a rocket, you're not launching a satellite. I can tell you that things like Red Bull, when you have success like that, and with, with the things that are happening now in the private space industry, with SpaceX and everybody having these successful flights, that more and more people are gonna be involved not only in space, but I think the stratosphere um, has got a lot of opportunity for cost-effective communications and also air travel and some other things. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there and I do think that once there are more success stories that the, the private money is gonna flow into it. Um, I, I do think it's the new frontier uh, of aviation. Uh, it's too bad the Concorde isn't flying anymore. You know, but the Concorde should be flying at 65 or 70,000 feet, not 55. 